Well, welcome everybody to the Resilient Leadership Podcast, where everything we do is aimed at helping you to lead with greater calm, clarity, and conviction, even in anxious times. And my name is Bridget, and as always, I am joined by my wonderful collaborator, Irvin Nugent. And Irvin, chime in and tell folks how you're doing today. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a busy time, but good work and lots of interesting different places and As we speak in D.C. at the end of December here, or the end of December, end of February, uh, spring has all of a sudden decided to show its head. But of course, never trust that in the D.C. area because you can get snow just just around the (laughs) corner. Don't jinx us. I know, I know, I promise not to jinx you, but uh, things are going well. And I am super excited about today's episode because it comes up in coaching a lot. And I think people are so curious about it. So Bridget, what are we going to focus on today? Yeah, it's an interesting topic for sure. And uh, the title of it is, of course, Workplace Politics Played Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of our goals today is to dispel the myth that workplace politics are always bad. I think a lot of folks have a pejorative view of politics in general, but specifically organizational or workplace politics. And uh, when I hear a client say something like, oh, well, that person is just really political and I don't do that. I don't play that game or I don't want that promotion because that means I'll have to play politics and I just don't care for that. I get really curious. Uh, Mm -hmm. I pay attention to that because it's often Mm -hmm. a red flag for me. And we'll discuss why that is the case, because, you know, truth be told, politics in the workplace are not inherently bad. It depends on how you play them. And that's Mm -hmm. what we're going to talk about is how can you play them well? But first, a question for you, Urban. So I I am curious. I said a lot of people have a pejorative view of workplace politics. I'm curious, is that true of you? And even if it isn't now, was it when you were actually a leader in a organization? Yes, a hundred percent. I totally agree. (laughs) Because What's so funny, when people talk about politics and you think, well, what is it? They'll say things like, well, it's kissing the boss's ass or it's plotting to do something or the whispering behind the scenes and it's or it's playing the game until, you know, you have to play it no more. And it is. It's all this subtone of being deceitful and hiding and and something in the dark that's not in the light. It is all over the place. And you know, maybe some of that has to do with the unhealthiness of, of political debate yeah. in general, yeah. you know, but certainly, yeah, I mean, I grew up in Northern Ireland and politics were not, were not a very positive thing either there. So it was interesting, even the language around that. But it is, I think when people use that language, they're referring to something that is not positive, but rather something that's hidden and something that's not in the light. Mm-hmm. So. Bridget, maybe then uh, we should start by, we we both agree that it can be something positive. So then maybe we should define what it is we mean by workplace politics. And maybe that's a good place to start. Indeed it is, because let's be clear about our terms, right? So so I, I got curious and looked up some different definitions. And here's one out of a book called Organizational Behavior. And here's what they said. Workplace politics are informal, unofficial, and sometimes behind the scenes efforts to sell ideas, influence people, or increase power in order to achieve key priorities or objectives. Kind of interesting, right? So they're informal, they're unofficial, right? Some of that behind the scenes that you mentioned, but it's about selling ideas. It's about influencing. And quite frankly, Politics have been around as long as there have been families. Mm. Okay, so think about this. I had three kids. A couple of my kids now have kids. And what I recall vividly is how early my own children learned to play politics with me and my husband. And what Mm. they would do is figure out very early, and I'm talking like they were still toddlers, who to go to for what? Like, don't ask dad for this, but you can ask mom. And if you ask mom, don't let dad know, you know, and they just knew how to play us. And they knew what our hot buttons were and our our soft spots. And it was extraordinary, their political awareness. (laughs) So 
you know, I think we've all been playing a form of politics. We've all been selling our ideas and seeking to gain influence over people in power from a very early age, right? So Irvin, I, I, you know, I read that definition. I'm, I'm curious what stood out to you in the definition, but I'm also curious about like your own family system growing up. Like, can you relate to what I just said about kids learning family politics and playing them at an early age? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I do love that definition. You know, there's there's one out there in the world, you know, being a salesperson as well evokes this reaction. You know, I'm not a salesperson because, as if salespeople are something dirty. Yeah. And yet in the reality is we're all salespeople. We are all selling something. And in reality, that's what I love about that, that because the work we do is important and because our vision is important, it's important, therefore, that we want to advance this because we believe that this will impact positively either the organization or the work it does. Okay. And so, therefore, politics is about promoting that. It mm-hmm. is about making sure that that idea is on the table and making sure that people have the opportunity to truly listen to that idea and we get people on board because the idea is important. And yeah. I think when we look at it that way, it's a little bit different. Families, I can remember. So one of the one of the fierce political debates in the Nugent family was we didn't really do vacation, long vacations, but we little trips. And where would the trip be? Mm. And normally it, it was either we go to the city with Dublin, the big city, okay. or we go to the beach, Bunkrana. Okay. And we, what we knew, there was five of us, four, four girls, myself. We knew that mom had the most influence, that really, she really made the decision, although dad was. <laughs> And so we would absolutely politic her, you know, about, well, we should go to the city and this is why we should do the city and this, that, and the other. And we would influence it. I can remember, you know, and then one of us would get our way and, you know, we'd get to the city or something. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of that was, you know, at a young age learning, you know, first of all, who had the influence? Right. So it was subtle enough to know who had the power. Then we, we knew we had to sell our idea, our vision of why should it be the city or why should it be the beach? Yeah. And if you didn't know that, you didn't get any any voice in where you had your little vacations, your short vacations. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, you know, like there's a family example, but I think in organizations, the same thing happens. You know, if you're going to abdicate, I'm um, saying I don't get involved in politics or I don't play this game. The reality is, you know, you're you're probably going to be sidelined. And I'm curious, kind of, Bridget, kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the word sideline. What's, what I've observed that's very interesting is you're going to get sidelined if you play politics poorly or if mm. you don't play it at all. Yeah. Either way, it's the same result. I'm thinking of a yeah. client who was incredibly political, but he played it poorly. And by that, I mean that people believed he did it almost exclusively for his own self-interest. He kissed up really, really well, but he was not particularly great to his peers. And so eventually, now he did have some influence in the organization and the uh, COO loved him, but nobody Mm. else did. And it eventually Mm. came back to haunt him and he had to find another job. So he got sidelined. Okay. And he played it, but he played it poorly. Now I'm thinking of other clients who opt out. And then yeah. they grow, I think, f- increasingly frustrated and maybe a bit mm. resentful when they see yeah. other teams and groups getting things that they don't get. Yeah. You know, they don't realize that some of that isn't because they're bad people. They're just in the game, so to speak. Right? Yeah. It's kind of interesting, yeah. isn't it? I, yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So, so we know, and I loved your family story, by the way, that is such, such a great example. We know that in families, politics are being played in any relationship system. They're there, but I don't know, like, have they always been around or why did they even emerge at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it is. I think from time immemorial, we have had to influence others. When we decided to live together in groups and communities, et cetera, then politics were born because we had to resolve things. And, you know, if you look back, say, at the ancient Greeks, you know, that's where we get things like democracy and and all of those terms happening. And Aristotle himself wrote a lot about the word politics comes from Aristotle. And what was that about? It was that in any community, you have competing interests. 
that everyone doesn't want the same thing. And so how do you resolve that? How do we resolve in a community two different visions, two different needs? And so hopefully you have wonderful rational decision making, but sometimes, you know, that's not going to resolve anything. And so you have these competing agendas, competing interests. And so therefore, you know, politics is born because sometimes resources are are scarce. You know, in a community, where do we put our resources? Do we put it for this or do we put it for that? Right. And there's disagreement. And so naturally, therefore, we have politics and politics helps us come to a decision. Not necessarily that everyone disagrees, everyone agrees with, but a decision that that we can go through a process of really discerning where we're going to put these limited resources for our own interest group. And there, there is politics in a nutshell. Yeah. And of course, if you think about that notion of competing interests, competing agendas, um, scarce resources, I mean, that's what goes on in any workplace and organization is that Absolutely. inevitably you yeah. have differing viewpoints and you have differing interests. Whether yeah. you work in an office with 10 people, 30 people, or 30,000, you're going to yeah. see some form of politics, which as you're describing, Irvin, originates or arises out of a need to resolve these competing interests when the rational system has failed Mm. to do so. So we have all these rational system processes in place, like strategic planning offsites and and budgetary processes and recurring meetings. And we, right, we come together and we try to figure out, okay, what are our priorities and and how are we going to allocate resources? But sometimes we, even when we think we've come to agreement, we find out we really haven't, you know? And so then people, to your point, aspire to advance an agenda that they care about. And they're going to find a way to do it. And now how they do that informal advancing of the agenda matters, but doing it in and of itself is just a fact of organizational life. So you can eschew politics all you want, but it's kind of like, saying, I don't believe in the sun, you know, doesn't get you very far, right? Okay, yep. so here are two interesting statistics I wanted to share with you, Irvin, about organizational politics. In a survey done of managers, 93% of them reported that workplace politics is a part of their life, their everyday workplace experience. Okay? And 70% of those same managers felt that in order to be successful, a person has to engage in politics. That's kind mm-hmm. of interesting, right? What do you think? Absolutely. Because, if, if you know, that beautiful definition about politics we just mentioned really is about, it's about these relationships. And ultimately, you know, we've said time and time again, organizational life boils down to sets of relationships that we're in. Right. And in those relationships, we are influencing each other. Influence is not a dirty word. Yeah. And so therefore, part of that is putting together a coalition for, for an idea and, and bringing people together. And so what are good leaders? Good leaders are people who have the power to influence others, to bring them along in a certain vision or a certain way. And so a lot of that is we don't necessarily associate that with politics, but it is politics. Sure. It is this ability. And so therefore, these absolutely exist. And not only that, but success. If you're going to be successful in the workplace, you have to really learn how do I interact with other people and how do I use these relationships, influence those relationships as well, and know when to, to call upon people as yes. well. That's part of the subtlety there as well, not necessarily you know abusing it as well. I think from our conversation so far, one of the things we're picking up is there's a good way of doing it and there's a bad way of doing it. I'm curious, Bridget, how would you make that distinction of how politics shows up in our workplace? Yeah. So generally speaking, I think that if if we are pursuing political behavior, largely for our own self-interest, I mentioned that client earlier that I, I spoke of who people perceive that's exactly what he was doing, right? Then Mm. his behavior is going to be viewed as negative and he is going to erode trust. So part of playing the game of politics well is, can you engage in these influencing behaviors while maintaining relationships, Mm. while maintaining trust? Because once those go, you're into the negative territory of politics, right? Because you can't influence people without trust. 
and connection. So I think, so two things, trust and connection have to be maintained. And you really got to search your, your own heart about why you're engaging in these behaviors. Is it really just about you? Or is it about you and you and the welfare of your team, the broader interests of the institution that you serve? And, and, and we all have to look in the mirror to answer that question, right? Yeah. So yeah. those are some general thoughts about politics in a positive way. And a term I use is principled politics. Mm. So the principles there are, it's about the interests of the greater good. It's about maintaining trust and it's a focus on the importance of connection and relationships. Now that's generally speaking, let's get down to brass tacks, shall we? And talk about examples of good versus bad politics, as I think then that really brings it into sharper view, doesn't it? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Irvin, when you think of bad politics, what are some mm-hmm. examples you would you would share either from your own experience or from from your work as a coach? So, you know, I think if politics is about the common good and advancing an idea, very often bad examples are where people put themselves before the common good. And so things like that, like an example of taking credit for the work of others. So inflating yourself over others. You know, and nothing can be more deflating to other people, and especially when they find out. But you think you might do it in secret, and all of a sudden it comes out. Or throwing someone underneath the bus to make sure that you're not being blamed, you know, and the politics there. Now, oh boy, did I have a good example of this. I have started flying around a lot more. So I find myself in planes this last year. And I had an extraordinary, extraordinary announcement from a captain that I'd never heard before. Whoa. And I actually said, what is this about? So the plane had uh, touched back. And, you know, nowadays you kind of expect, are we really touching back or just going to sit for a few minutes? So anyway, we taxi out and we're sitting in the runway and the captain comes on. The captain says, I'm really sorry for this delay. We're just waiting for some paperwork to be filled that hadn't been filled out by the gate agent. It was fine. You know, it wasn't a huge break. So we're waiting there about 10 more minutes and the captain clearly is a little annoyed. And he comes on again and says, we're just trying to get this resolved. I'm very sorry. And then finally, he comes on about five minutes later. It's now resolved. I just found out it's the gate agents. The gate agent is new and obviously doesn't know their job. So I invite you to write to United to complain about them. And I was like, <laughs> way to take one for the team oh, there. Man. It, it, was, it was extraordinary. I'd never, you know, and there was an example of bad politics, like leaving a bad taste in your mouth Ooh. and someone who, who wasn't able to take the team with them. The other one then is a little sneaky, and we do this all, we see this all the time of passing the chain of command. So if you can't get your way with one person, then can I get to that person's boss or someone of influence above them to get my way without having the, you know, the honesty or integrity of going to the person? Turf wars, you know, sometimes making bigger vision decisions requires we have to give something up. Yeah. And that's a risk. And so sometimes we want to hold on and we want to keep that. We don't want to give anything up. We want to gain everything, but not give anything up. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, another one that I see is the meeting before the meeting. So sometimes, you know, um, let's make sure we control the outcome here. And so let's make some decisions and then go in with a fait accompli, which of course then people are like, what was that? What happened? Where did that come from? Yeah. I didn't even, people are thinking, I didn't even hear about this topic. How how is it that- Five out of the six of us are already on board with, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where did that come from? <laughs> so I think all of those, you can see that this is what gives politics a bad name. And these behaviors, it's like, whoa, this is, this is really, it adds drama. It adds friction. It adds anxiety to, to uh, organizational politics. What about, were you any, anything yeah. else you would add? Bridget? Yeah. Well, those are such great examples. I mean, I guess. Another one that I would add, and I, I'm thinking of this because I, I recently saw this exact thing kind of go down, which is, um, you know, s- sort of lobbying for mm. people in the organization and responsibilities in the organization that lie elsewhere to come under your umbrella. Mm. And if you do that kind of in a behind the scenes way without any conversation with the person who currently manages those people and resources, right? 
Yeah. And maybe you go to your boss and maybe you make a great case for why that should be. But really, it's just about building your empire and you have kept the other person in the dark. Whew, that is that's not a good example of politics played well. And that will come back to, to bite you. It's perfectly legitimate to look at the organizational structure and notice that some departments are not in the right place, you know, and it doesn't mm. make sense. And, and maybe that department should be under you because it makes sense for the broader organizational goals. So again, there's some nuance to this because the, the same behavior almost, right? But depending on how you, you enact it or play it could go positive or negative, right? Totally. I'm reminded of something we say often in this podcast and when we do our resilient leadership training, which is that a lack of clarity in the rational system will provoke reactivity in the emotional system. And so one of the things to keep in mind is even though we're saying politics are not inherently bad, when things in the rational system are not clear and people become more anxious, political behavior will go up for sure. And people won't be very thoughtful about it, you know? So it's kind of like, think of bad politics as a form of reactivity. Mm -hmm. And so as leaders, one of the things we can do to keep politics at an appropriate and thoughtful level is working to create that clarity in the organization around roles, around responsibilities, around, I mean, How about just things like basic human resources systems, like who gets promoted and why, and how do we have our performance evaluate? When those things are unclear, politics goes up, not in a good way, and then morale goes down accordingly. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we all know bad politics when we see it. I think we've all been up against some of those things you shared, Irvin. We've been embroiled in them. But let's contrast those negative examples with some principled politics, some examples of the game played well, what, what would come to your mind first? You know, it's interesting. I think we have discussed some ideas that in the past we might not have called politics, but in many ways in this definition, they are. One thing that comes to mind would be self-advocacy. So there's a, there's a subtle balance here. I think we've mentioned, you know, sometimes people use politics in a bad way to gain advantage. And this is not self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is really about stepping into, you know, supporting your idea, your team with the, the aim to get more influence, more support, because you truly believe that with that, you'll be able to accomplish more. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to advocate, you know, kind of what you've been able to accomplish and really bring to light the workings of the team, and really to do that in a way that can help, you know, the team accomplish even more. Yeah. And I think, you know, that part of that really good self-advocacy is important of maybe why, and maybe, you know, different departments are competing for resources or limited resources and making that argument to self-advocate, you know, actually, if we had even more, the impact of that would be even greater. Yeah. And to do that with a clarity, I think is really important. You know, Irvin, let me just say something in reaction to what you just said. I think that's why a lot of people have an aversion to self-advocacy is because they they equate it Mm. with negative politics. You know, like, I'm not going to get into that. My work should speak for itself. Speak for itself. Yeah. And we've mentioned that before, but, but just to connect the dots there that... Self-advocacy is not a dirty word, just like sales Mm. isn't. And I think this is people who don't engage in that grow resentful, like I said before, because they don't get resources that others do. Okay, what else? The other thing is managing upwards. So, you know, we always, we do a lot of work around managing our direct reports, but also we got to manage your boss and manage your supervisor. And, you know, this again can be a dirty game. It's like, you know, doing this deceptively, but then part of it really is, learning about a lot of things about your boss. How do they like to communicate? How do they like to go around making decisions? Um, What's the way they like information put before them? Do we know what they're interested in, what their passions are? And to use this information, again, to advocate for your position, ideas to make the decision-making easier. All of that is politics, but it's honorable politics in the sense Mm -hmm. of making this easy and, and providing a passageway that's really helpful. Yeah, I love that. 
Yeah, because yeah. there's a whole big difference between kissing up, as you said earlier. Yeah. I think you used yeah. a, a, yeah. a more explicit term and, and managing up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then one other thing is, is, you know, not every decision has to be a win-lose or a lose-win. I think there are ways of making decisions win-win. And can we make a decision or maybe some of these competing interests that can turn out to be, you know, a win-win for, and, and maybe the win for one party is a little later on, it's not immediate, et cetera. But, but can we think about that rather than one person having to lose and one one, can we actually look at different ways of winning together? Mm-hmm. So Bridget, what else comes to mind? There are three that come to mind for me. Yeah, I think. This notion of getting buy-in, you know, I hear that term all the time. Oh, we got to get buy-in, you know. And of course, that's true in the sense that we have to enroll people in our interests, our agenda, and we have to gain support. So that is a political skill. How Mm. well can you get Mm. buy-in? And I'm going to go back to your family example. The first question you got to ask yourself is, Who's the most influential person that we need to get on board? If for, for your family, it was the mom for that particular yeah. decision. Yes. Okay. So that's a great question to ask for this initiative, yeah. for this decision, or for this idea. Who is most important that we enroll? All right. Yeah. And then how do we enroll them? What would be the right way or the best way? to gain their support. And how can we do that without being like, you use the word sneaky, you know, without being sneaky or like throwing people under the bus. Because I think sometimes people get buy-in in ways that throw other people on the bus, right? So do you have the political savvy and skill to influence others such that they adopt your agenda? Mm. Yeah, that's an important skill, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Irvin, I want to say one other thing, and then I'm going to invite you to share a practice with folks. And that is just a way of bottom lining all of this, right? Is the core question here is are we in the game or are we on the sidelines? If you're not playing politics at all and you think it's a very dirty word, you're on the sidelines in some regard in your career. And in your ability to gain influence. And if you're playing it poorly, ultimately, you will be sidelined by people who eventually have enough of you, right? (laughs) And they'll find a way maybe to make it very uncomfortable for you to continue doing what you're doing. So remember that if you are engaging in politics for the reasons, Urban, that you shared, not purely out of self interest, but to advance a position or a, an agenda that benefits more than just you and you play it well, then you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. All right. Now, all of that said, what might you give our leaders as some food for thought to wrap up? Well, this has been really a wonderfully provocative conversation. So I actually think, you know, you talked there about a baseline. I think actually a little baseline assessment for where are we at in our relationship with politics and workplace politics? So like, so the first thing then would be a, kind of a taking stock. Do you have a negative view of workplace politics? When you hear that word, what's going through your mind? And to what extent has this created an aversion for you off politics? Do you avoid it at all costs? Do you avoid people who you regard as political at all costs? So just think about that. Just think about what does that word resonate? When I think of my workspace, how does that show up? Who does it show up? And what's my relationship? And then the second question would be, then can we change the lens? Maybe if we have a negative view of politics, would there be a way of seeing this through a different lens, maybe as just something that's very natural. Think back of your own family system. How did politics there? How, how, how did influencing show up in your family system? And then just kind of think about it really at the core of this. This is about relationships and it's about using the different relationships in our lives to influence. And then a last one would be then if we're averse to it and if we've kind of said, I'm going to be in the sidelines, 
what might be a way of us tiptoeing into the political world mm. in the workplace? What behavior could I do? What might I be able to do to influence uh, for myself or for my team? Mm. And just think about what, you know, what could I do? What would be a step? What would be a way of selling an idea, of speaking up for an idea? Like even that sometimes is, you know, notice your practice at a meeting. You know, how often maybe take the risk of saying something when perhaps, you know, you, you're, you're falling silent about something or something you really believe in. Maybe there's a discussion going on and you really think this is important. Take the risk of saying, look, I really think this is important because and, and putting yourself out there and seeing that as, as, as kind of creating good vibes around an idea. Mm, that's great. I love the way you said, um, how might you tiptoe? Into yes, yeah, yeah, tiptoe into the game, right? I love yeah. it, love it. Well, this certainly has been a really fascinating conversation, Irvin. And for our listeners, I would just encourage you to think about you know, who do you know in your network of colleagues, uh, family members, friends who maybe have an aversion to workplace politics mm. and struggle with it. And um, if they don't listen to this podcast, share this episode with them. Uh, you know, our intent always is to help all of us, our listeners and ourselves, right, to find some different ways to think, to see and to lead. So Irvin, as always, it has been a pleasure having the conversation with you. Thank you very much. My pleasure as well. I've really enjoyed this episode and hopefully listeners have got a lot of it as well. And we look forward to joining you in the next episode. Take care, folks. Bye now.